you'll please take the Word of God with me. I want you to go to the New Testament. I want to go to James, James chapter 5. We'll find ourselves at verse 15. James chapter 5 and verse 15. We began talking about this verse a couple of Wednesdays ago. And I'm going to talk about it, Lord willing, tonight and, um, and this chapter. And we will, Lord willing, conclude it on Wednesday talking about this. What we'll be talking about we find in verse 15. And the Bible says in James chapter 5 and verse 15... And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The very first part of that phrase, or that verse, we find a phrase, and that phrase is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. Let's pray. Father, we do want to come to you tonight by faith. We want to come believing you. And that you have something for us, you want to speak to us, you want to speak mildly to us tonight through the power of your Holy Spirit. May we let you, as we look into your word, may you drive home the simple truth that we're going to see here in this passage of Scripture. May you make it very evident to us and help us with it. We'll thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We had said previously when we started looking at this, this passage of Scripture that this book was written to the 12 tribes which were scattered abroad. The book tells us that in James 1.1. 1, 1. And if this was the Jewish people and they were scattered abroad um, into different places. And so this would be written to them. It's a very practical book for the believer. It reveals what biblical faith will produce in every believer's life. Um, as you read through the book, you have certain things that are laid out in here. Some people look at this book as it was written to unbelievers on how to become believers, uh, but that's not true. This book was written to Jewish believers who were scattered, that were part of probably the church in Jerusalem there, and were scattered abroad throughout, and they were already believers. And it was telling them how they were going to live the abundant Christian life. Because if you live under the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, this book comes alive to you. This book is how every believer is supposed to be functioning as we follow the Lord. And, um, and, he, and he says back in chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, My brethren, um, of course he was talking to the Jews, but I think he was talking to um, brethren in Christ. And, uh, and so he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And he goes on and talks about these things in their life that we can see the Lord work. In John 10.10, 10, we also read that he said, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. And so this is the abundant Christian life, James. And uh, we're not looking through the whole book, but we are skimming it and taking some things from it. Thinking about this prayer of faith, what we said about this is about prayer and faith is prayer is a desire expressed by a petition to the Lord. We desire something, we make a petition to the Lord for it, and that's our prayer. In general, that's what prayer is. Uh, faith is a moral conviction or of, a, of a religious truth or the truthfulness of God. We have a conviction, we believe what God has said, and because we believe it, that is our faith in what God has said. And then it tells us that we are to have this prayer of faith. And Bible reading and prayer are two of the most important things in a believer's life. And when we stop walking with God like we ought to, those are the first things that go. Or we think we have it all together, we quit reading our Bibles, and we quit spending time with God in prayer, and we function in what we know to be right without the power of God. And we find in the Bible that it says that um, we shouldn't be around those people. <laughs> so why do we want to be those people? that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And so we have here um, Bible reading and prayer is necessary, and this is how the Lord speaks to us, and this is how we speak to the Lord, um, and we need that communication in our life. And the prayer of faith is part of that. It's part of that communication. And we go to God in, in belief, and we speak to Him, and we let him speak to us. Well, we've already looked at in this book of James, and we said previously as well is that prayer and faith go through this whole book. 
Those are the cords that run from chapter 1 to chapter 5. And at the end, we find the prayer of faith. But all the way through, we find faith and we find praying uh, throughout. And we already saw in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 that the Lord gives us an invitation to pray. We already found that. And in, verse, in chapter 1, we, we learned that we must accept this invitation by faith to prayer. It says, let him ask of God by faith. So we ought to go to God by faith, seeking him and accepting this invitation that he's given to us. And then in chapter 2, we, we saw that we must live the Christian life by faith. We saw that in chapter 2, verse 17 through 20, there was a phrase that was there that says, faith without works is what? Dead. Is dead. And so we live the Christian life by faith. And so we've got, again, prayer. We accept that invitation to come to him in prayer and ask him. But it's by faith. We live the Christian life by faith. We mature in the Christian life by faith. We got to chapter 3. And, of course, most people know chapter 3 as being the tongue chapter. Uh, talking about our tongue. And uh, the Bible says the same as a perfect man. That's maturity. That's the person who can control their tongue. He says, the Bible says, that he can control the whole body. If you can control the tongue, meaning if God has control of our tongue, if he has control of our heart, and it can control our tongue, then our whole life can be controlled. And we are a mature believer walking lockstep with God in faith, by faith. We're maturing. And uh, so we looked at those things. And, and that invitation that he's giving us to come to him, to ask of him, to live before him, to mature before him, it's all by faith. It's all by faith. And then in chapter 4, the Lord gives us instruction in prayer. Instruction in prayer. So let's begin in verse number 1. We're just going to look at the first five verses here of chapter 4. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lust, that war in your members? What's the answer? Yes. <laughs> yes, they come from our own lust. And then it says in verse 2, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So first off in this instruction in prayer, the Lord instructs us that we must ask. This is very simple. Very simple. But how often do we fall short of asking God for something? Now you know and I know, the Bible says, that God already knows what we have need before we ever ask. But we fall short to ask God. The Lord wants us to have things, so why would He not give them to us? He doesn't want us to have everything, but He does want us to have things. There are things that He, would, he does not mind that we have, and then we have needs. And the Lord gives us our needs, and by the way, He does not give us our wants, He gives us our needs. There are times He's given me what I wanted. That was like a Icing on the cake, right? And uh, he'll give me that. Um, but he gives us what we need. And the need that we already identified in James chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. That was the need here he was talking about, was wisdom. But we have that need all the time. I hope you realize that, that you have this need of wisdom, and you need the wisdom of God. Wisdom that's from above, not wisdom that's earthly. The Bible says in, in chapter uh, 3, there's also talking about the tongue. It talks about that wisdom as well. Uh, we need to ask. Let's look at some other verses here in the Bible that back that up. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give you good things to them, or give good things to them that ask him? Hmm. Over and over it was said, ask, ask, ask. As a parent, you know, we, we like for our children to ask for things. Oh, we could give them things, right? But if they ask, we know they want it. And we know they're making that communication. And we like that. And he says, ask. And the Lord Jesus was saying this, that we ought to ask, we ought to seek, we ought to knock. 
We ought to have some anticipation about it. We ought to be persistent in it. Uh, we ought to have faith in coming and asking. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19. Jesus again is speaking and he says, Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. They agree, but he didn't say you just agreed about it. Then you asked for it. Asked for it. Again, how many times have we thought about something, but we stopped short of asking God for it? You have not because you, you, don't, you didn't ask for it. You asked for it. Chapter 21 of Matthew and verse 22. Again, Jesus says this. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, that's key, believing, ye shall receive. Asking. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. There's a power that's working in us. It's the Holy Spirit of God that come to take up permanent residence in us until this body folds and we go to be with the Lord in heaven. And that power that's working in us, he said he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. But he did say ask. And most of the time when you ask, you think. Sometimes you don't think before you ask. But... You think, you ask, you ask the Lord. He's able, it's in you, the power's in you, God can do it, but he said we have to ask. So we need to make it a habit in our life to ask the Lord for everything that we need. Get in the habit. Ask the Lord for it. Seek the Lord for it. Look back at James chapter 4. He said you have not because you ask not. Look at verse 3. So let's just say, for sake of argument, we got the asking down. It's a habit in our life, and we're asking. Well, then we come to verse 3. Verse 3 says, ye ask and receive not. Oh, well, well, now we're asking. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're asking. But the Bible says you're still not receiving it. And it says, because ye ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. So not only does the Lord instruct us that we must ask, but now he's instructing us that we must ask in his will. We're not asking in his will. The reason why we're not getting it is because we're not asking. But if we are asking and we're still not getting it, we're not asking in his will. We must be in a fleshly desire, asking out of the lust of our flesh for something that the Lord does not desire for us to have. We must be asking in his will. I want you to go to 1 John chapter 5 with me. And this is not always the case. Sometimes the Lord will tell us, wait. So he does not always, because he doesn't give us what we ask right away, is it not his will? Sometimes it's wait. But you have to discern that as you're talking to the Lord and as you're asking him about it and if it's in his will. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. So our confidence is not in our prayers. It's not in how good we are. It's in him. Our confidence lies in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, that's key, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. That's pretty assured. If we can determine that it's God's will and we ask for that thing in God's will, we can be very confident that he's hearing us and that he's going to give us the petition that we called out on him and that we asked him for. Our will needs to be the Lord's will. Or his will is our will. That's when we ask and we can see God answer what we asked him because we believe it to be so. We know his will to be so. 
And if he puts that in our hearts, then obviously he wants to do that in our life. I want you to go to 1 Kings with me. I want you to see something about Elijah. Of course, he's in chapter 5 of James. But if we go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah prayed and he asked the Lord to send fire down from heaven. Remember that story? Did God send fire down from heaven? Yep. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You know what? We're still halting between two opinions today. Is the world are going to be our God or is God going to be our God? Is our flesh going to be our God or is God going to be our God? Make up your mind. That's what he's telling them. He said, you can't have both of them. They didn't answer him anything. Look down at verse 24. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So he's in a battle here with the uh, 400 prophets of Baal. Just Elijah, 400 prophets of Baal. Who's God? Is it the Jehovah God of the Israelites or is it Baal? This would have been something to see. I mean, in my sanctified imagination, this would be something to see. Um, And he goes, and you kind of know the story, I believe. In verse 32, it says, And with the stones he built an altar in uh, in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench round about the altar as great as could contain two measures of seed. So I think that's about five gallons this trench that he made around the altar. Now, they had made an altar, and they have been cutting themselves, and they have been crying out to their God, false God, Baal, the world, and nothing was happening. So he built them an altar, and he put these trenches around it, and you know, he told them to put water in the trenches and douse everything, the, all the wood, all the, everything, the stones, and everything's on, now full of water, waterlogged. Then the Bible comes to verse 36. And it says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Now what's he doing here? What's he doing? He's praying. He's calling on God. And he's about to ask him for something. And I think he's going to ask in his will. By faith. He said, Let it be known this day or this, let it be known that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then, he asked. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell. And consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's what happens when you ask in God's will. That's what happens. Elijah asking God's will. What about Peter? Remember Peter walked on the water? He said, Lord, would, would you have me come out there to you? We could go to Matthew 14, 27 to 31. That's where you find it. But you remember, he walked on water, got boisterous. The storm was about him. He got his eyes off the Lord, which is the object of his faith, and got it on the storm. And he started sinking. And he said, Lord, save me. And the amazing thing is, is that He must have been a ninja, Jesus. Because it said as soon as he said that, he reached out and grabbed him. All right? He started sinking immediately when he got his eyes off the Lord. How did the Lord have time enough to catch him? He already knew. He already knew what was going to happen. But he reached his hand out, and he grabbed him, and he saved him. Now, he asked him, but he was asking, obviously, in God's will. God wanted to help him. 
And he said, save me. And the Lord grabbed hold of his hand and pulled him up. Now, the Lord rebuked him. <laughs> he doubted. He looked at the storm. He doubted the Lord that was standing before him. But he did ask him the Lord's will, or the Lord wouldn't have reached out his hand and he wouldn't have pulled him up. And we need to know the Lord's will so that we can ask it and have complete confidence in his provision. So the Lord instructs us to ask, but he instructs us to ask in his will. Now, let's assume that you're asking and I'm asking and that we understand what God's will is about things because we're in God's word and we're understanding what God's word says about it and we have the mind of Christ and so when we ask things, we believe as much as possible that God's leading us to ask these things. Well, there's something else. Verse 4 and 5, the Bible says, well, let's get back over to James. James chapter 5, or 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever will be a friend of the, of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? So the Lord instructs us that we must not only ask and ask in the Lord's will, but we must be in right fellowship with Him. Our heart has to be right. Look, I can, I can ask things of God, and I can ask things of God that's His will because I know what the Scripture says. But that doesn't mean I'm walking with Him. That doesn't mean my heart's right with Him. That doesn't mean I'm not regarding iniquity in my heart. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or His ear that is dull that it cannot hear us, but it's my sin that causes it to appear that way. We have to walk in fellowship with the Lord. Look at John 15 and verse 7. Jesus said this, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. We see this little word abide there, which is a very important word, and it means to live in. Now we understand whenever we trust to Christ as our Savior that He's in us and we're in Him from Romans chapter 8 that we looked at and that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We got all of God that we'll ever get when we got saved. We don't get any more God. Abiding is our part. That's God having us. That's us emptying ourselves of us and dying and letting Him have control. This abiding, this living in, this dwelling in Him is, a, is our part. This is, this is our fellowship. Fellowship. You see, a relationship with God has everything to do with what He's done. Fellowship with God has everything to do with what we're allowing Him to do in our lives. If you don't have fellowship with God, it's not God's fault. If you'll yield to Him and walk with Him and obey Him, you can have fellowship with Him. If we live in Jesus Christ, then we cannot live in the flesh. We find that in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, the only way we can have fellowship with God and walk with Him and not be an enemy of God or, or being an adulterer or adulteress with being with the world when God says, no, you're supposed to be with me, you're married to me, but you're putting yourself in, in this adulterous relationship with the world, things I hate, you're not the world's, you're mine, I bought you with a price, but you're out selling yourself to the world. That's what the Bible's saying. You're, we are not in fellowship. We are not going the same way. And you're asking me for these things? If you'll walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't be selling yourself to the world, your time and everything else to the world. And I'll answer you. If we're abiding, then we'll be right in fellowship with Him. That's what John 15 is talking about. 
Look at 1 John with me. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, talking about the Lord, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. We're walking in the light, as he is in the light. Now, only a believer can do that. Unbeliever cannot walk in the light. They don't even know what the light is. They're blinded and, uh, by the devil. So we're walking in the light as he's in the light. And the Bible doesn't say necessarily that we have fellowship with him. It says we have fellowship one with another. Well, because we are having fellowship with him. I don't know any other way that the New Testament church in the book of Acts could be in one accord other than they were walking in the light. They were yielded to the Holy Spirit. They were walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. One accord, thousands of people, thousands of people getting saved and baptized, being part of that local assembly there in Jerusalem, and they're all walking in one accord. It's hard enough for me to walk in one accord with one other person. <laughs> it's hard to get myself to walk in one accord with God than to die to self if I don't put anybody else in the equation. But everybody walking together, it's because you're walking with God. You're having fellowship with God. And so you can have fellowship with each other. Look at 1 John 3. These are instructions that we're giving, that are given to us in James chapter 4 about prayer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, there's that word again, we're supposed to ask. Ask in His will, ask while we're in fellowship with Him. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasant in His sight. Now, what, do you, what would you call the last part of that verse? keeping His commandments and doing those things which are pleasing in His sight. What do you think we call that? Obedience. Obedience? What else are we talking about? We used it as an F word, and it's not a bad word. Fellowship. Fellowship. Right? Yeah. If you're not obedient to Him and you're not doing the things that please Him, the only way you can do that is you're going to walk by faith, but if you're not doing that, you don't have fellowship with Him. You're not walking in light. You can walk in all the good things you want to walk in and do all the good things you want to walk in, but if you're not in fellowship with Him, you're not walking in light. The Bible says here in verse 23, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He hath given us commandment. And he that keepeth His commandments, all this is fellowship, he that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. And hereby we know that He abideth in us because the, or by the Spirit which He hath given us. Fellowship. But whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because the next two and a half verses is talking about fellowship with Him. Because we're walking with Him. And as we believe Him because we're walking with Him, we receive what we've asked. So when we ask for Ask the Lord for something according to His will. We also need to be walking with the Lord. This is simple. This is simple. But I always need this reminder. I come to James chapter 4. I say, yeah, I don't have because I'm not asking. Well, I am asking, but I'm not asking in His will. I am asking, and I think I'm asking in His will to the best of my understanding, but you know what's wrong? I'm not really walking with God like I ought to be walking with God. I'm believing something else. I'm believing my flesh. I'm trusting my flesh. I'm not trusting God. But if I'll just trust the Lord and ask Him in His will, then He will give me what I need. He gives us instructions here about prayer. And this is the prayer of faith. 
So not just a prayer. This is not just putting up a petition. It's a prayer believing God. He's the object of our faith and believing what he's told us. So what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Let's exercise the prayer of faith. Father, help us tonight. It is simple. You've laid it out for us in your word. Um, We just have to check those boxes off and know that we're asking. We're asking in your will, and we're asking as we're having fellowship with you. And you said you would give it to us. May we have discernment to know what's our flesh and what's your will and ask in your will. And I'm thankful that you'll tell us to wait. Maybe it is your will, and maybe to the best of our understanding it is, but maybe not for right now. And I'm thankful for those times you tell us no, even though we were convinced it was your will, because later we remember, we realize that really wasn't what you wanted for us. Although we might understand it's not a bad thing, but it wasn't the best thing. And I'm thankful that you know that, and you know our hearts, and you know everything about us. So, Father, I pray you got us tonight and how we respond to your word. And may you give us this prayer of faith in our hearts. May your word, as it stirs us up, may we respond to it with the faith that is swelling up within us. And as you strive with us tonight, as you pull us and speak to us about our prayer life, may it be something that we make a matter of importance in our life and we get to the place where we need to be and keep moving forward with you in this area because I would I would say and I know that all of our failures are prayer failures and so may we find you to be faithful as we come to you and Father we ask this in Jesus name Amen heads bowed eyes closed altars are open would you like to come tell the Lord talk to him about your prayer life Commit some things to him about your prayer life. Wherever you're at, that's where you need to be at. You Maybe you're not even asking. And you say, Lord, I need my heart to be the heart attitude that when things come up, I'm asking you for those. Instinctively, I just ask you for them out of faith. And maybe it's you're, that's not where you're at. Maybe you're asking, but you're just not always sure what his will is. Well, pray for his will. Pray that you would understand his will. The Holy Spirit's praying in God's will for you. Jesus is making intercession in God the Father's will for you. He doesn't want to hide that from us, but we do need to walk with him. And maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're praying and maybe you're asking in his will because you know that's what the scripture says, but you're not walking the way you ought to be walking with him. You're trying to walk in the darkness, but claim what's only in the light. That doesn't work. It never has worked. It never will work. It hasn't worked for me. It won't work for you. Are you taking your needs to the Lord and asking Him to meet them? Do you know what the will of the Lord is and what you're asking for? Are you walking in close fellowship with Him? Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm not even saved. I don't even know Jesus as my Savior. I've never asked Him to save me, to believe on Him to forgive my sins and to give me his righteousness. Would that be you tonight? Somebody here says, that's me. You'd raise your hand and say, I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I need to do that. Or maybe you'd say, I did it, but I'm not really sure I believed it, that I really trusted Jesus as my Savior. Because there's people that pray prayers, but they don't. I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation. The Bible says if you, if you, if you believed on him, you have everlasting life. You know him. The Holy Spirit's in you. Holy Spirit will be bearing witness with your spirit that you are his child. If there's no bearing witness in your life, I'd be concerned about that. And there needs to be more, I believe, in a believer's life than just a time when you prayed and asked the Lord to save you. There needs to be some more things taking place in your life as a proof of your salvation. I think you get saved by trusting Jesus as your Savior, but I think there's things that come along with salvation. So be some things that are working in your life. Father, thank you for your word tonight again. May you seal these things in our hearts that we've committed to you, and may you help us be 
the people of prayer you want us to be. I believe it would make a difference here in Wetumpka. It would make a difference in our church family. It would make a difference in our families as individuals, in our individual lives, and those we're around, those we work with, those we play with, all those things, if we would just be people of prayer. Those are the most special times to spend with you. May we not cast those to the side. Lord, would you bless the business meeting we're about to have. Would you help our eyes to be upon you and trust you, Lord, as we try to move forward by faith. You can do what you want for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.